from Studio 2 in the Center for Innovation and Media, this is The Bridge. Thank you for joining us. I'm Emily Kinzer. And I'm Chris Davis. Welcome to The Bridge. This is an effort of a cross-platform class in the College of Mass Communication at Middle Tennessee State University. That's right, Chris. Students from the School of Journalism and Electronic Media Communication Department have created this project. Our crew of students aims to focus on multimedia journalism on a cross-platform scale. Now we've got a lot of great stories to get to, but to start off the broadcast, we want to tell you about some new information we've just learned regarding the Holly Bobo case that has recently been released. We returned indictments against 39-year-old Jason Wayne Autry. On Tuesday, the TBI announced charges against Jason Wayne Autry. Autry is charged with especially aggravated kidnapping and first-degree murder. He was arraigned today in the Decatur County District Court. TBI officials say more arrests are expected. We believe that there are individuals out there um, that have information, uh, possible involvement, and I think this sends a clear message to them that uh, they should be expecting a knock at their door pretty soon. Now this case is one that still continues to define a small Tennessee town. It broke their hearts, tested their community. It was an abduction of their sister, their daughter, friend, and even in some cases, a stranger named Holly Bobo. Holly went missing April 13th. It was a case that made national headlines. Police in Tennessee say they are expanding their search for missing nursing student Holly Bobo. TBI continues to investigate areas in Decatur County. Holly Bobo was last spotted Wednesday morning. Holly's face displayed across the country as people watched to hear the story of a young nursing student taken from her own backyard. I was out there shortly uh, within two hours of everything because we were in class when we learned. We weren't but about 10 minutes into class when we were getting the notice that EMS had been notified. The last person to see her her own brother as she walked into the woods with a man he thought to be her boyfriend. If he thought his sister was in danger, um, I'm pretty sure he would have done everything he could have. Um, you know, he thought it was the boyfriend, you know, and a lot of people have criticized him over that. Police started their investigation with few leads. When she was first abducted, you know, there were thousands of people showing up to search and and uh, everybody pulled together and uh, kind of worked as one, you know, with a common goal. And, and one year passed, and then two, still with no answers. The case might have gone cold, but the community didn't. Well, it, it doesn't let uh, a case fall by the wayside, I guess. Uh, it, it keeps it active, keeps it on people's minds. Um, you know, we don't want the justice system to lose sight. Whether they knew Holly. Um, Holly was one of my best friends in high school and college. Or not. Uh, as far as I actually know, when the Bobos are done, but they need the help, they need the support, so that's what we do. We all pull together, we support. We're all close knit, we all have a heart. They all join together for one common goal. We're still praying that they'll find her and bring her back home if she is still out there. Everyone doing their part to find Holly. Searching, trying to get information. Karen's been out with multiple friends and family trying to get flyers put out with, to try and bring Holly home. I've been searching for Holly for three years. There's always been pink bows here because we all had that hope for Holly to come home. Good afternoon. And then finally three years later, Present, the day they Present all prayed for. Decatur County Grand Jury handed down indictment of especially aggravated kidnapping and first degree felony murder on Zachary Rye Adams. But weren't ready to hear. Right now it's just heartbreak. It's just not the way we hoped it to turn out. It's just not. Another devastation, another sock in the stomach, another letdown. It's a truly sad day in Decatur County because this didn't just affect one family, it affects two. Well, of course, there's disappointment, you know, because everybody wanted Holly to come back safe and sound, and, you know, we realize now that that's not going to happen. And they do have some very difficult days ahead of it, uh, but we just wanted to know that we're 
We were right there with them. And then, instead of accepting defeat, the mission of the community changed. They're, they're making, a, this is a time of readjustment for them. From Bring Holly Home. We're going to get justice. 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 I just pray that justice is served. To justice for Holly. Coming up a little bit later in the broadcast, the story of Holly Bobo is far from over. With charges finally filed in her case, we'll show you how the community is continuing to fight for Holly. Still to come on the bridge, the battle for medical marijuana is happening on Capitol Hill. We'll tell you why one politician has a personal stake in the bill's future. And a soldier paralyzed after a tragic accident is told he'll never walk again. And that is until a charity helps him out. We'll have that more when we come back. Controversial Tennessee House Bill 1385, the legalization of medical marijuana, has been snuffed out. That's right, Chris, but the flames are likely to rekindle. Bridge reporter Jennifer Dutton brings us the latest information happening on Capitol Hill about the controversial bill. That's right. I went to Nashville and spoke to many people who have lined up on both sides of this heated issue, including a politician who is actually in support of the bill. Tennessee Democrat State Representative Sherry Jones is a sponsor of the Cooser Coon Medical Cannabis Act. Having lost her brother to Crohn's disease, she knows the pain a person can go through when fighting a disease. It was just a few months after that that we lost him and he suffered tremendously. And there's really no reason for people to suffer the way we seem to want to make them. Jones says that where legal, the use of medical marijuana is also helping improve the lives of children suffering from epilepsy. It's why families like the Coosers, whose name is on the bill, are leaving Tennessee and other states for Colorado. They have 300 seizures a day. This product, when, when the parents move their children to Colorado, which some have, can cut their seizures down to two a day. And uh, the little Cooser baby can now move her hands which is a huge deal. She can open her eyes now, which is a more than huge deal. While Tennessee State Representative Sherry Jones is fighting here at the State Legislation Plaza, many others are fighting against the legalization of medical marijuana. I, I don't want Tennessee to be that state. <laughs> If, if another state wants to take that route, I guess that's up to them, but please don't make it us. MTSU Medical Director Dr. Eric Clark has been a vocal opponent for almost a decade. He believes a child's growing and developing brain will be damaged after use. You're starting to see in, in, in the states that have legalized it, some of these uh, renodocs, they're just coming out to put up a shingle to uh, write the medication and they're they're really not being conscientious to the, the patient. You know, they'll write a prescription for anything with pain and are, are we getting good medical care with that? It's, it's, it's not. That's really not the case as we hear directly from patients. Marijuana activist Paul Kuhn is the other name on the Cooser Kuhn Medical Cannabis Act. Kuhn's wife passed away from cancer, but he says she got relief from the plant while other drugs failed to help. It's much safer. You can't overdose and virtually every other drug that a doctor prescribes. You can't overdose if you take too much. I mean, aspirin. People die every year from overdosing on aspirin. Ibuprofen causes the what intestinal bleeding. So everyday drugs that are just available over the counter are far more dangerous, really, than marijuana. Marijuana is a gateway drug to other drug use. MTSU addictions counselor Kionda Stanley helps students overcome drug problems. She sees it a different way. Stanley thinks the marijuana will mask the real medical issue and make things worse in the long run. Now you have something that you want to do want to smoke the marijuana because of the positive effects. But then you have this underlying issue that means that you're going to need to stop smoking in order to treat, let's say, depression. So it's going to cause more conflict, um, more problems. It's not about people getting high and laying around in corners, eating Cheetos. That is not what this is about. Representative Jones misses her brother every day. She remains committed to legalizing medical marijuana so that no one else will have to endure the same pain. While not everyone would agree, she remains optimistic that someday the bill will pass in Tennessee. 
Now, according to usatoday.com, to date, 20 states plus the District of Columbia have already legalized medical marijuana. But just this past month, the Tennessee House Health Subcommittee voted no on the Cooser Coon Medical Cannabis Act, meaning it will be the next legislative session at the earliest before this measure or a similar one is tested. Really great story there, Jen. Now, tell us the difference between medical marijuana and let's say recreational marijuana. Can you explain the difference to us? Yes, Dr. Clark says there's actually a very big difference between the regular marijuana and medical marijuana. The psychoactive ingredient in marijuana is THC. That means the medical marijuana given to most children, like the Cooser baby with epilepsy, has no THC, so it won't affect the baby's brain function. Also, medical marijuana can be given orally, so no smoke is involved. Now, did Dr. Clark explain the possible side effects of using medical marijuana? Yes, he mentions possible harm to different parts of the brain, lack of ambition, even emphysema. He did say he was open to the possibility of legalizing medical marijuana if the marijuana was available to help us and was tested regularly. To see more of my interview with Dr. Clark, go to www.mtsuthebridge.com. Thanks so much, Jennifer. Now, coming up next, a life-changing development gives a soldier back his confidence and ability to walk. Plus, cases of cyberbullying are increasing day by day, and so is the damage. How is one state representative working to crack down and hold bullies accountable? That's coming up next, only on The Bridge. When Army pilot Gary Linfoot crashed his helicopter in Iraq in 2008, doctors told him he would never walk again. Now, thanks to some amazing technology, a strong will, and the generosity of a few companies, for a few hours each week, Gary is able to stand once again. For about an hour a day, retired Army Chief Warrant Officer Gary Linfoot walks around his home in Clarksville. But for Gary and his family, getting to this point was a long and difficult journey. That person that went over to Iraq was not the same person that came home. That, that person stayed there. Any war veteran you talk to will tell you, war changes people. But for this former pilot, this was true on multiple levels. It was business as usual in Iraq for Gary on the night of May 31st, 2008. For me that day, it was just a, a typical mission, something I had done hundreds of times before. On the way to the target, the main rotor drive shaft blew out of the helicopter, causing it to crash. So it hit the ground instantly. Uh, I, I knew my legs weren't working. Uh, from there, we just start working on getting the other, craft, other aircraft in there to uh, evacuate. Once Gary was stabilized, he was able to call his wife, who was in Clarksville at the time, from the hospital in Iraq. He told me that he had been in a crash and that he had hurt himself pretty bad. And I thought to myself, I thought, well, you sound pretty good. But Gary wasn't so good. Doctors determined that Linfoot had suffered a major spinal cord injury. Upon impact, uh, my back was broken, my co-pilot's back was broken, and uh, I instantly received a, uh, a spinal cord injury as a result of that, um, of that impact and the, and the bone breakage in the back. Next was a grueling three months of surgeries, recovery time, and therapy that took the Linfoot family across the globe to five different medical and rehab centers in just three months. Throughout Gary's rehabilitation process, he and Mary experienced a wide range of emotions. Shock, denial, um, despair, anger, um, helplessness, and then at the same time, then you experience uh, hope because you see things that are, are going on. And, and Every day was trying to figure out how the next day was going to be better. And um, Gary, Gary was always very strong through it and pretty much a leader. And we both just really did things together. And a couple times, it, you know, things were so frustrating, we had to remind each other, hey, we're on the same team here. You know, <laughs> let's, let's move forward. Gary and Mary's youngest son, Hayden, also struggled with the news. It took a while to get from he's injured to he's never going to walk again kind of thing. Uh, so it, it didn't all happen at once. It definitely took about, about a year basically to like be like, all right, so this is um, how it's going to be for a really long time. 
As the Linfoots navigated their new life, opportunities came from unexpected places. Not long after the accident, Gary received an iBot wheelchair from three different veterans groups that can raise him to standing level and even climb stairs. Then in 2012 came a phone call that would change Gary's life. It was an official from American Airlines, and he wanted Gary to demonstrate a new device called the Exoskeleton at American Airlines Annual Sky Ball. So uh, we went out to California, got trained up, and had about three days of training, and then didn't use it again for a month. And then a month later, we were at, at Sky Ball in October. All three of Gary's children were there for his big moment. And that was the first time in over four years that my kids had seen me stand up. And so that was a, a very emotional event for them. Hayden was videoing it with his phone, and the girls were just crying like crazy, and everyone else was cheering and clapping and very happy. It was it was very exciting. First of all, he's walking again. It's almost like a miracle, and also it's like. Technology is really cool because technology is doing all this really cool stuff. Little did Gary know, Skyball was just the beginning. Thanks to the generosity of several foundations and organizations, Gary is the first U.S. veteran to receive an exoskeleton for personal use. The suit is not advanced enough for continuous wear. However, Gary typically walks in the suit about an hour a day. The suit works by Gary shifting his weight from foot to foot. The computer will sense that Gary is in a safe position to make a step, and then the suit will make that step for him. Since he received the suit in November, using it has become second nature. There, just in case of emergency, but he's got it mastered. Since Gary can't use the suit alone, Mary and Hayden are trained to operate it. I'm like one of just a few people in the world that isn't a... Um, an instructor who can do, operate the thing. I mean, I knew we could do it, but I was a little nervous and very cautious, and um, and now it's easy and whatever, you know, put it on and we don't even have to talk. Gary's hope is that the exoskeleton provides a medical benefit to paralyzed patients. We are we are part of a, a trial. The trial is going to last one year, and the goal of this trial is just to see what the long-term medical benefits are of standing and walking around. Researchers theorize that by using the suit daily, Gary's bone density will actually become stronger. In addition to potential medical benefits, there are also psychological benefits to using the suit. Being in the exoskeleton, standing up again, being at eye level with people, it's just, you get a sense of, uh, I guess you could call it, you get a little bit of dignity back and to Mary, being able to see her proud husband standing tall once again is priceless. When he gets in the exoskeleton and he gets to stand and he gets to walk, it's kind of like winning. It's like, we're beating this thing. This is one, this is cool. This is one step closer to, you know, being normal or back to the way things were. It's, it's, it's like a victory. What an incredible story, Chris. It's always nice to see veterans shown in such a positive story from this. But with all of the veterans groups that have supported him, has he done anything to give back? He really has, Emily. Uh, he and his wife, Mary, actually rode in a bike race from Ground Zero in New York all the way to Shanksville, Pennsylvania to wow. mark 10 years of 9-11. And they actually did all of that in an effort to raise money for the Wounded Warrior Project. Wow, that sounds like it was an amazing experience for the both of them. It really was. They said it was very challenging for them, uh, but it was definitely worthwhile. Also, Mary and uh, Gary, in their own spare time, go and speak to school groups and to really get students excited about technology and science. Gary told me that he hopes that the students he talks to today are the ones that design his suit in the future. So. Wow, that is such an amazing story. Again, thank you for sharing that with us. And I'm, I'm sure this is not going to be the last breakthrough in technology we see when it comes to paralyzed veterans such as Gary. Absolutely not. Still to come on the bridge, part two of the Holly Bobo story, how a small-knit community is fighting to defend the girl that they lost.
But first, it could soon be easier to charge people for cyberbullying. We'll show you the progress that bill is making coming up next. As the use of technology in social media grows, so is the outbreak of bullying and cyberbullying. That's right, Chris. And the effects are more serious than you may think. People right here in Middle Tennessee are working to change these daunting statistics. Learn to live life outside of the box, people, while you are young because you're going in one when you die. These strong words echoed in Laverne Middle School's auditorium during a recent anti-bullying rally. We actually traveled throughout the U.S. putting on anti-bullying rally tours, which teach kids the importance of not bullying, why bullying isn't cool, what to do if you are being bullied, and how to effectively tell someone. Tiffany Love is trying to prevent kids from becoming another suicide statistic. Rutherford County was ranked number three in the uh, Tennessee school systems of bullying statistics. So what we've done is with our pledge cards, we make those children sign those pledge cards, we report into them, we talk to their teachers, we talk to their families, and then they let us know what's going on with the bullying situation at school. And that's how we number our statistics. And I, Emily Kinzer, promise not to bully, be an onlooker in a bullying situation, or engage in bullying of any kind. These pledges at the anti-bullying rally are just one of many actions being done to stop bullying. For Tiffany, it's personal. She was bullied, then became a bully herself. Growing up in a violent home made her want to fight, but not anymore. Now she wants to help. We also teach about the acronym BULLY, which stands for Because You Lack Love Yourself. And we actually bring out a casket on stage to teach children that their words can actually put someone in that casket. She sees cyberbullying as a big problem. Anytime that you can hide behind, you know, internet, and not reveal who you are, you can get away with things that most people would not be brave enough to do in person. But she's not the only one who's working for change. There is nothing that we can do right now in Tennessee to stop somebody from assaulting you. They can bully, they can create lies, they can say anything they want, and there's no repercussions for it. Tennessee State Representative Jeremy Faison has proposed a bill in the House that he hopes will help stop cyberbullying. If it falls under cyberbullying, you can petition the local sheriff, and the sheriff can say, hey, we want to see the ISP server for this. I think people would be like, well, all of a sudden my name might be open. It's easy for the bullies to get away with cyberbullying. Say no. Unless there's a court order, you can't get the ISP server number. Faison is trying to protect the people he serves. I have constituents at home who have been assaulted basically on the internet. He thinks your name should be attached to everything you say on the internet. Now, I'm all about freedom of speech. I, I will fight and die for the First Amendment. But the First Amendment implies that you have your name behind what you said. You, you ought to have your name behind it. If you want to say that, fine, this is America. We believe in freedom of speech. But man up. Put your name that you're the one who said it. He's hopeful this bill will promote change. I really feel like a lot of it will go away. If they realize that you're just saying something and you can be found out immediately who you're, what you're saying. But the World Wide Web isn't all bad. Surf around and you can find dedicated people working to stop this problem. <laughs> We're helping educate parents on what to look for, the tips to, to give the parents advice that maybe they can recognize when their kids are being bullied. Joe Yeager is the founder of the Parents Guide to Social Media on Facebook. He also runs the anti-bullying mom website. This website is helping parents who have kids using social media. We gave them some tips to look for, things like are your kids not using the computer as much as they used to? Do they close the computer or switch an application off when mom or dad walk by? You know, behavior that's out of the ordinary, because that's often a sign that they're being bullied and, and they're afraid. Yeager got involved two years ago when his daughter came across questionable material online while searching for a popular kids' book series. This was really scary for the six-year-old and also for her dad. That's when he knew he had to do something to protect her. Be proactive with your kids. Um, talk to them in advance, online, offline. If you see something that they're doing, talk to them about it. He recommends that parents get involved in what their kids are doing online. Others in the fight agree. Getting people to accept that there's a problem that's big enough in America right now that we need as a society to stop and look at it, that's a tough sell. Definitely is a problem. It's a big problem and 
we got to keep looking for solutions. Rutherford County Sheriff Markel Drain sees it far too often. Cyberbullying is, is, is the worst for bullying because most kids who are cyberbullied, the biggest thing that affect them is the embarrassment because it's different if you bully a kid in front of one or two students or maybe a crowd. But once you do it on Facebook, Instagram, everybody sees it. Their friends see it and their friends see it. So it's the embarrassment that everybody knows about it. So that's what causes kids to go into depression and eventually be suicidal. But the bullies themselves can't be forgotten. Social media guru Dana Boyd recently spoke at MTSU and says they may also be the victims. One of the things people don't realize often is that those who perpetrate bullying, bullies, are often themselves suffering abuse, dealing with sexuality issues, dealing with mental health struggles, trying to figure out their own place in things, and they're lashing out. So when we go and punish them, it just further reinforces their feeling that they don't belong, and it makes everything worse. Boyd has advice for everyone using social media. Listen, be respectful, be tolerant of differences, you know, and take a moment to realize that the world is bigger than just your friend group. Anyone can be a victim of cyberbullying, even in the comfort of your own room. If you have or know of someone who's been cyberbullied, let them know they're not alone and that they should seek help. Make a pledge not to be a bully. This is an environment where you can connect to people from around the world. Appreciate that. Great story, Emily. Really, really, really pressing issue nowadays. Now, I think it really shows that this is a bigger problem than what many people may expect. That's exactly right, Chris, and really no one is above to being victim to a, being cyberbullied. It can happen to anyone at any age. Now, Emily, is with, with the internet evolving, is it any easier to prosecute these crimes? It's really hard to prosecute people for cyberbullying, and you know, as Representative Faison said, right now there's nothing being done in Tennessee to stop this. So with his bill, he's hoping that IP addresses to, will be released, and with that happening, it would stop cyberbullying because they'll be found out who's doing it really quickly. What's the time frame look like for Representative Faison's bill? Well, he said there's probably not going to be done anything with it this year, but he's hoping to keep working on this and to keep raising awareness about it and hopefully in the next year that something will be done about it. Well, great work once again, Emily. It's definitely an issue that won't Thank be you. going anywhere. That's exactly right. Well, after the break, friends, families, and even strangers remember Holly and talk about how hard her disappearance has been. That's exactly right. Plus the battle in the courtroom, how they're fighting for justice. Stay tuned because that's coming up next, only on The Bridge. Earlier we told you of the story of the young blonde nursing student named Holly Bobo who tragically disappeared three years ago. But many don't know the story of the community that cried for her, searched for her, and her disappearance, even more her life, changed that town forever. You just survive when something this tragic happens. Parsons, Tennessee is a stereotypical small West Tennessee town. Well, it's just a small town. Everybody knows everybody. Uh, we may not be blood related, but, but we're all family. It's a small place and a good place to live. And Bobo is a name everyone knows in one way or another. I grew up in the same na neighborhood as her dad. Holly was one of my best friends. I was Holly's teacher at the time of her abduction. And, and I'm personal friends of the Bobo family. And Holly's life touched their hearts. And most of the time what we were doing was just being silly and just joking around. Beautiful young lady, had a bright future ahead of her. And her disappearance broke them. Can you imagine not knowing where your child is when you get home? It's broken everybody's heart. You know, even though it's been three years, we're all still kind of floored by what we've learned and you know what we have found out you know it's uh, it's tough and we'll never completely get over it no when Holly Bobo first disappeared the message of the community was help us bring Holly home now that murder charges have been filed in this case the new message is justice for Holly with local resident Zach Adams charged and the search is called off instead of quitting the community is fighting harder than ever Heavenly Father we once again, we come to you with a very humble heart, a very broken heart. For three years, Holly hasn't had a voice. Somebody took that away from her. It's up to each and every one of us to be Holly's voice. They don't want her to be a story. They want her to be remembered as who she was. Since the indictments were announced in March, multiple Justice for Holly rallies have been held. 
Well, this one is more in support of the family to encourage them to let them know that their friends have not forgotten them and that we're, we're going to be with them and beside them in, in the days ahead. They have people here for them. If they have, you know, they want to cry, there, there's a shoulder to lean on. They need somebody to pray, there's people to pray for them. And I think this uh, helps keep everyone involved, reminded of how important it is to, uh, to, to. After a prayer service at Holly's home church, a procession of motorcycles and cars traveled across Decatur County, each adorned with pink and green bows to show that though the searches have ceased, the community is back in the Bobos 100%. We can come together for a cause and we've, we've shown that with this case. Their support. People showing up and offering their support and presence. Never wavered. We're here to support her. Uh, if it takes now, from 20 years from now, we're going to get justice for Holly. But there are some in the community that also remember Zach. Everybody knew the Adams family. Everybody knows the Bobo family. You know, just, it's a bad deal. And are fighting to defend him. What did they find this time? Come on, folks. Get real. They trying to blame Zach because he's an outlaw. He's an old country boy. And he's been in dope so long that now, by God, they trying to hang him. There's also those that think their legal system failed them. If the justice system would have put him in penitentiary for his drug charges, maybe Holly would be alive today. I don't even understand how he could be out of the system to have this happen. On April 9th, the murder case was scheduled to begin, but a variety of issues stalled it. The wheels of justice move slowly. Decatur County Circuit Court Judge Creed McGinley allowed Adams to waive his right to appear in court. If I were to draw one word for today's status conference, it would be uncertain. And due to the fact he had not retained an attorney, his status hearing could not take place. We really cannot go forward without him being afforded his constitutional right to counsel. You know, it seems like that everybody was unprepared and, and you know, he hasn't retained an attorney and you know, it, uh, it was kind of a letdown, really. Of course, uh, the family's uh, somewhat disappointed. They wanted everything to proceed. To, uh, we want it to be fair, but at the same time, we want it to be as quickly as possible. It seemed like to me that the defense knew, they knew what they were doing by postponing and, and putting off. Though there's no indication on when this case will end. Um, we need to get the case moving forward before it loses the speed that is needed. But I also respect the judge's opinion in that, you know, we need to be cautious so that justice is served on both sides. The resounding message stays the same. A hurting community. You know, we're frustrated. It's very, very frustrating. Longing for answers in the pursuit of justice for someone they love. As bad a thing as it was, it brought the community closer together, which is a good thing, but I wish something else could have cause that. And the one thing they want everyone to know. We'll be right here. We'll be right behind them the whole time. We'll see it through to the end. Thank you for sharing that heartbreaking story, Chris. Now, I really, I realized that there was a status hearing for the two guys about an hour ago. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, Emily, both uh, Autry and Adams appeared in court today. The uh, defense did request 60 days to review documents on both sides. It's been a very extensive investigation and the prosecution has a lot of information. Um, so they're going to have to take some time to process through that. So the uh, next hearing is a little bit later than what they would normally have. Um, but uh, 60 days from now, June fourth is when both men will appear in court again. Wow, such a long and ongoing process. So can you tell us a little bit about the community reaction to all of this? Well, I think the community reaction, as with has been throughout this case, is a little bit of frustration. They want right. it to move faster. But I will tell you this, the community isn't going anywhere. Mm -hmm. They'll continue to have rallies for Holly, be there for the family, be there on court days. That town stops when these type of things happen. Mm -hmm. They take off work. They are there for the Bobos through thick and thin. Absolutely. So I know that you've talked personally with the Bobo family, and they haven't you know, said a lot just because of the nature of this case, but how are they handling all of these new developments? Considering all they've been through, it's been incredible, uh, Emily. They're just such a strong 
um, family. They, they, they rely on each other and they rely on the community of Parsons in Decatur County. And uh, when I talked to Karen and uh, Clint the last time uh, I was at one of the Holly rallies, um, she just really emphasized the fact she's so appreciative of those mm -hmm. people that come out and support them. I mean, she's very appreciative of the media too for keeping this relevant and keeping Holly's name in the news keeping people right. focused on it so this case can move forward. Right, I can imagine. So, well, thank you again for sharing such, you know, this heartbreaking story and bringing even more light to it. It's been such a privilege to cover the story, Emily. Absolutely. Well, thank you for joining us today on The Bridge. I'm Emily Kinzer. And I'm Chris Davis. Make sure you find us on our website. That's mtsuthebridge.com. And that's where em what Emily West designed for us, and this is where you can get our collaborative journalism class interviews from all of our students. From everyone at The Bridge, thanks for watching our broadcast. Have a great day and we'll see you right back here in fall 2014.